thank you very much. And I am not a professional futurist, unlike our previous two speakers. I am a technologist, uh, but I am going to be addressing other people's not futuristing, but predicting, because there are a lot of people who like to speculate about the fact that VR is dead, and what does that even mean, being that it's not alive? Uh, it's a technology thing that you wear on your head, and it makes pretty pictures. Uh, but anyway, I'm glad that many people have this thought, because it gives me a lovely framing device for my talk today. Uh, I don't think that it's really all that useful, so maybe I have that in common with uh, Bridget to say that whether or not it's dead doesn't really matter to me. What matters to me is whether or not you can do interesting and new and exciting things with it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of virtual reality. Uh, so what we see here is an illusion called Pepper's Ghost, uh, demonstrated in the Elizabethan, or I guess Victorian, I don't know, in the theater in 1862. I'm from America. I don't know what era that was. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, so, the way this works is that this is video reproduction. They're using a projector to do this. But you can imagine there being a half-silvered mirror, a tilted, half-transparent mirror between you and the stage. And there would be people in a brightly lit room under the stage, which presumably was a massive fire hazard. Uh, <laughs> but it would look as if there were these ghostly people performing on the stage in front of you. Uh, this was actually first demonstrated not in 1862, but by an Italian guy named Giambattista della Porta in 1584. It was first documented, which is insane. I can't even imagine things existing in 1584. I, I don't have that level of perspective. Uh, but fun fact about John Henry Pepper, who uh, created this illusion in England in 1862, in 1882... He was in Queensland, and there was a drought. And he said, I'm going to fix this drought. I'm going to make it rain by blowing up the sky. It didn't work. It didn't rain. Uh, he nearly killed a bunch of people who came to see him make it rain. It didn't work. But I think Lil Wayne would have been proud of him in trying to do that. Uh, so we skip ahead 100 years. So 100 years of VR history, not much happened between 1862 and 1962 in the context of virtual reality. Uh, but in 1962, Morton Heilig invents and patents the Sensorama, which is 3D, wide vision, has motion color, which is not that impressive. Color had been around for a while before then. Stereo sound, not that impressive, but it had smell, it had wind, it had vibrations. He would rig up a cameraman with three 35 millimeter cameras and send them out into the world to take immersive movies so you could put yourself in this refrigerator and imagine that you were riding a motorcycle. Uh, so that's also pretty cool. But if we jump ahead just six years, and if you remember, Mark on stage earlier was wearing a shirt representing for Pong, 1972. Uh, this is actually four years before that. So we had working virtual and augmented reality four years before Pong existed uh, in Ivan Sutherland's lab at the University of Utah. Uh, so that is pretty mind-blowing to me as well. So you can see this clean-cut young gentleman in the 1960s black and white. And he's looking around, he's connected to the ceiling by a bunch of pipes and levers and gizmos. And you can see that actually as he turns his head, this ghostly cube is represented before him. So Ivan Sutherland, who invented this, really smart guy, invented a lot of other computer science-y things, and in fact was awarded the Turing Award for it, which is basically the Nobel Prize for computer science-y things. Uh, but a couple of years before this, before the sort of Damocles head-mounted display in 1968, he wrote a paper called The Ultimate Display. And in that, he postulated the existence of basically the holodeck, if you've watched Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, a display that could control matter. So he said three examples. He said a chair would be real enough to sit in, handcuffs would be real enough to confine you, and a bullet would be real enough to kill you. Uh, which I think are an interesting set of choices. <laughs> And I'm not here to kink shame Mr. Sutherland because he's much smarter than I am, but I'm not sure if that's the direction I would have gone in. So the birth of what we actually would today call virtual reality 
was in the 1980s. So Jaron Lanier, uh, a technologist in the 80s, either coined or popularized the term virtual reality. He founded a company that did a lot of virtual reality research called VPL Research in 1984. Uh, the 80s were also the decade of cyberpunk, so we had Blade Runner, Tron, Akira in manga form all come out in 1982. In 1983, we had the first use of the word cyberpunk. Uh, 1988, Akira the movie comes out. Uh, and all of this sort of dystopian future was in the air in the 1980s about what you could do with technology. Uh, and the 1980s were also the decade of the power glove, just barely. So those of us who were not born in 2001, as Bridget was referring to, people who might have been alive during the 1980s, would remember The Wizard, starring Fred Savage. Yes, at least one fan of The Wizard. It's not good, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> Tobey Maguire was in it. Uh, so it was a virtual reality hand glove that could be used to control the Nintendo Entertainment System. That came out in 1989. Uh, it was discontinued in 1990. Uh, so was VPL Labs. Uh, so 1990 sort of marks the first death of VR. If we're talking about whether or not it's alive or dead, it's pretty definitively dead in the early 1990s. Uh, and here's where it gets even more dead. So 1995, we have the Virtual Boy. Uh, which was actually going to be pretty cool based on the technology that they acquired, but by the time they released it, they were so scared of getting sued out of their minds that they put it in a big metal box that was like lead shielded and you had to have stationery on your desk because they were afraid it would melt kids' eyeballs. Uh, I don't think that was true, but I never actually uh, worked on the technology. Uh, so everything was red. Uh, it was not very good. Uh, it was discontinued in 1996. Uh, by VR standards, even by today's VR standards, it sold pretty well. They sold 700,000 Virtual Boys, which is not bad for VR. Uh, for Nintendo, it's super bad because they had just come off having the Game Boy, which sold like 120 million units. So they're not happy with this. The guy who invented the Game Boy, Gunpei Yokoi, also invented the Virtual Boy. He resigns in relative disgrace and now VR is even more dead. So, 1995, if it wasn't dead already, it's dead some more, right? Uh, so, jump ahead 20 years, right? 20 years of wandering in the wilderness for virtual reality. Uh, and for me, I started grad school wanting to study virtual reality smack dab in the middle of those 20 years wandering in the wilderness. So I am definitely not a professional futurist because I make bad career choices. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, so what happens between 1995 when VR is very dead and 2012 when VR is, you know, getting up off the canvas and starting to make its big comeback? In 2007... Steve Jobs announces the first iPhone. In 2012, they sell 700 million smartphones in one year. That's a lot of smartphones. Uh, more, seven times more than every Game Boy ever sold. Uh, so what do we need for smartphones? We need large uh, resolution, high resolution displays. We need long battery life. We need wireless connectivity. We need motion sensors which are basically exactly the things that you need to build a consumer-focused VR equipment. Uh, so Paul Merlucky, smart guy, comes up with the idea, launches the Oculus Rift 2012. In 2014, Facebook acquires Oculus for three billion US dollars, which is a lot of money not just for VR and not even just for Nintendo. Three billion dollars is many dollars. Uh, so, a couple years later, Oculus keeps going, Paul Merlucky subsequently is fired from Facebook, <laughs> becomes a prominent Donald Trump supporter, and founds a defense contractor that likes to go after illegal immigrants in Texas. Meanwhile, Facebook continues to be Facebook. So the moral rectitude of people who are associated with virtual reality might not be great, 
might, might not be even good. So take all of that with a grain of salt. But that brings us to today. VR is as alive and well as it's ever been. So is VR dead? I mean, it's sort of my job to say that I don't think so. Uh, if you think it is, you can go get a drink because I'm going to be talking for a couple more minutes. Uh, but just for context, successful video game systems sell a hundred million copies worldwide, which seems like a lot, and it is a lot. I mean, you'd make a lot of money if you sold a hundred million of anything. Uh, the most successful VR product to date is probably the PlayStation VR. It's not a very good VR product in my opinion, but that's because I'm a snob and it's awful. Uh, they've sold about five million of them, so we're about like 5% of the way there to a massive breakthrough VR success. Uh, do I think we're ever going to get there? I kind of don't think so. I'm putting on my speculator hat for a moment, and I'm not sure that any VR headset is ever going to sell 100 million units, right? Uh, I just don't think it's that kind of technology. I don't think everybody needs to have one in their home. But I do think that there are things that you can do in VR that you can't do any other way. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about a couple of those things. Uh, so the first thing is embodied interaction. VR lets you interact with the virtual stimulus directly by manipulating it with your body. So you're not pressing X to swing a sword. You're uh, not actually a sword, you're swinging controller. Ivan Sutherland might prefer otherwise, but that's what we've got. Uh, so it lets you feel in your body, to think with your body. If you're an embodied cognition type of person, VR is much different than any other technology that has yet existed. So, and one of the things that's special about VR is that it is really 3D. So what we're watching now behind us is a, a sped up version of uh, a woman on YouTube painting in 3D using virtual reality technology. You actually have a little, you use your controller like a paintbrush and you can just put color in the air wherever you want. So this is the benefit of a technology that has never before been possible. You have never been able to just put color in space. So this is an entirely new artistic medium right, that didn't exist previously. Uh, now we're going to get into something a little bit more interesting, a little bit pra more practical perhaps, possibly a little bit more uh, controversial as well, is this idea of embodied perspective taking. So this hasn't really trickled down to consumer technology, but some researchers are looking at what are the effects of walking a virtual mile in somebody else's virtual shoes? Right, so what we're seeing here is a, we are not seeing the real person controlling this avatar, but a light-skinned person in a dark-skinned body having an interaction, right? This is not something that would be possible with sort of traditional technology. And they've found, at least in some cases, you know, I don't want to overstate the benefits here, but at least in some cases, people's bias toward people of other races or people with disabilities or people of different genders is reduced following walking a mile in their shoes, right? So this is something that could actually be a huge game changer if it turns out to work long term. It obviously requires more work. Um, another way where VR is pretty amazing already and is going to continue to be amazing into the future, in my opinion, is training. So this is an example of a virtual reality surgery trainer, right? And you might say, we've been doing surgery for 5,000 years or however long we've been doing surgery. What's so special about virtual reality training? And there are a lot of things that are special about virtual reality training, in my opinion, right? You can have access to it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? Generally, if you're training as a surgeon, your access to training is very limited. You watch somebody else do surgery, maybe you talk to a simulated patient, an actor pretending to have an ailment, and then you go do it, right? See one, do one, teach one, that's what they say. Here you can see a bunch 
you can do a bunch before you ever have to actually interact with a patient. You can get feedback in real time. You can get objective feedback of what you're doing. Did you make a cut too deep or not deep enough? We can track all this data. Uh, and you can practice an entire procedure, possibly an hours long procedure, without wasting everyone else's time. So, on to one more example. My final example is virtual reality treatment or therapy. And in this case, this is an application that is used for uh, treatment for people with paranoia. The treatment is to expose them to social situations where they will not be endangered. These people literally cannot possibly have harbor negative feelings uh, toward the uh, participant. So you can acclimate in a safe, structured, supervised passion, uh, fashion, excuse me, uh, to this potentially dangerous scenario. Uh, I've talked for a couple minutes about the good things about VR. Uh, before I close, I'm going to be a little bit pouring some water on that, just to be sort of fair and balanced. Uh, there's this notion of VR as an empathy machine, that this is going to be the technology that can make you feel things that you could never feel before. Uh, notably, this is an example, clouds over Cedra, uh, looking at a Syrian refugee camp in 360 degree video, put on by the United Nations. Uh, one of the creators, Chris Milk, is one of the biggest proponents of this idea of VR as an empathy machine. He did a famous TED talk about it. Uh, personally, I think it's a little bit overblown, and even if it works, I'm not entirely sure that that's a good thing. Because an empathy machine is only a couple of steps removed from being trauma tourism, right? There are people who experience these experiences for real every day, and it's sort of a luxury to be able to pop on a VR headset and, you know, pop over to Syria and see what's going on. Like, that's probably not necessarily the most morally beneficial thing that you can do. Uh, but that is it for me. I'm going to close also with a William Gibson quote. I don't know what's happening here. This is so insane. I'm saying that the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. What we're seeing in virtual reality techne te technology today is going to be happening in the future, at least in the near future. I don't know that I can predict 2041, but certainly in the next five to 10 years, these technologies that already exist are going to be coming out into the real world and hopefully making your lives better. Thank you. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.